So a little bit of housekeeping uh, on your way in or while you're in, sitting in here, you, you may have received a blue marble. Hopefully you have it. I'd, if you could uh, find it, if you put it away, put it in your hand. Uh, and while you're doing that, I just want to say, I don't think it's been said before, but this is the coolest podium I think I've ever <laughs> stood next to. And uh, if it's OK, I think I'll drive it home. Is that right? Uh, you know, past the Teslas, and they'll all look out and be like, whoa, jealous of your, your podium car. Super cool. It's even cooler from up here than it is from out there. So if you take your blue marble out and hold it up like that, that is what we look like right now from a million miles away, depending on the length of your forearm, of course. I did the math. We look like a small blue marble. And it's a reminder that we are small relative to the universe. And we're blue because of the water. We're a water planet. We're water beings. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what I'd like you to do with your blue marble a little bit later. But just keep it in your hand as we, as we chat. If you have questions, comments, feedback, you want to debate or fight over something or go a little bit deeper, get in touch. I'm pretty easy to find. Email, Twitter. We use the hashtag BlueMind to talk about this conversation. But this is our responsibility, this little blue marble that we call home. As far as we know, there's not another one out there that we're going to anytime soon. NASA has been searching the universe for Earth-like planets. They have an acronym they call FTW, follow the water, as they search the universe. They actually use that acronym for short over at NASA, FTW. They're searching for water because we know water is the matrix of life here. We know it works, so we search for other places where it may occur. So what I want you to do is receive this blue marble as a small token of gratitude for the work that you're doing, for the work that you're going to do when you leave here and go back home. And I want to ask you, what's your water? Simple question, but what is your water? What's, what's the water that you fell in love with? Who were you with? What is the name of that water? How did it feel? What were the circumstances? Now, there are a lot of different answers to that very simple, slightly provocative question. For some people, their water is necessary directly for hygiene and hydration. It's a very intimate relationship, perhaps involving the movement of water in buckets in small quantities. For others, the relationship is a little more exciting and a little more adventurous, maybe a little more X Games. For some, it's an interaction with the other beings that live in the water, perhaps standing on the shore or cliff, looking out and watching animals hang out together. Maybe from the bow, looking out, This is a backup. We're switching. Maybe from the bow of a boat. If you've ever been in the bow and the dolphins have come, you know exactly what that feels like. Surrounded by water, the dolphins stay until they decide it's time to go on their terms, and then they're gone. Perhaps your water experience was more submergence. It's our friend Brian Scary at the bottom of the ocean, face to face with a Beautiful animal, quite a moment. Maybe it's in a flowing river, casting your line, meditating, maybe catching nothing, but happy to be there. When we're in the water with those we love, we create a, a special bond. We create deeper memories, nostalgia. We fall more in love with each other. Sometimes our water experience involves the built environment, a pier, a building, a place to go. It's a special pier in the UK that actually burnt down a year ago. It will be rebuilt because it carries so many memories for so many generations who have spent time there. Perhaps your water is more urban. Maybe a rooftop pool. This is one in Singapore that I've, I've never been swimming in. Uh, pretty nice spot there on, on the roof of a skyscraper looking out over the city. 
And maybe your water is more domestic, indoor, in your, <laughs> your bathtub, like our friend Jack. Uh, his answer is, oh yeah, my bathtub with my eggs and my puppy dog. That's his water, curlers in his hair. Or maybe something really simple, like the, the water fountain. I remember, you know, this photo always reminds me of that standing in line as a little kid in elementary school in New Jersey, waiting for my turn. I was so thirsty, and you just move a step forward. One person at a time, you finally get to the water fountain and get to be just in charge of the water fountain and luxuri luxuriate in the taste of that water. And then you get back at the end of the line, and if you want another drink, you wait on line again. Remember those days? Pre-plastic bottles, right? We had water fountains. They worked. On a real personal level, my water earliest memories involved my father. My best memories were just being in the water with dad, holding onto his shoulders. We did this thing called the turtle ride. He'd dive under and I'd hold on. We'd hold our breath. And then we'd come back up for a breath. And then we'd go back under. And I, I do that with my daughters. And it's their favorite memories. A little older, I, I remember backpacking in, in the Rocky Mountains and that water called Deep Lake. It's just seared into my neurons. I can I look at a photo like that and I can, I can feel the grass between my toes. I can, I can feel the water. I can smell the air. I remember it so clearly. I remember the, the wolves howling while I tried to sleep in my little tent. <laughs> the tent wall just seems so thin when you're listening to those wolves. But as a kid, I was completely enthralled and in love with turtles. I just had a thing for turtles for some reason. And I built a career around being a marine biologist and studying turtles. And one of the first things that we did when I was a grad student is we put a, a satellite transmitter on this sea turtle. And let's see if that'll play for us. Yeah, there we go. We named her Adelita. We put a satellite transmitter on her shell and we released her into the ocean. And she swam off. And the interesting thing about this little video clip that I'll repeat a few times is that she, she swam about 10 meters and then paused because the tank that she was living in was 10 meters in diameter. So watch as it comes around again. She enters the water and then she kind of pauses there as if to say, wall? Where's the wall? And there is no wall, so she continues to swim through an imaginary wall. So a turtle, a little turtle brain, imagined a wall where there was no wall. And then she swam through that imaginary wall. Interesting metaphor for this group in particular. The walls that we create in our mind that aren't really there, that stop us from swimming where we need to go. Well, in Adelita's case, we named her Adelita, she swam home. And home, in her case, was the other side of the ocean. Her home, swimming from Baja, California, Mexico, across the North Pacific, all the way to Japan. And I was a grad student, and I was tracking her over the course of 368 days. And I'd say, this is probably my first, officially my first float. I floated for a year, riding this turtle's back day and night, and day and night for 368 days across the open Pacific Ocean until she reached her home. We shared her data online in real time, and I was told that was career suicide. The scientists don't share their data until they're published in peer-reviewed journals. But I put it up anyway, and it wasn't career suicide. In fact, I met poets and other scientists who knew how to do things that I didn't know how to do. So by sharing and building a network and reaching out and giving and corresponding and communicating, we built this like super turtle geek network. <laughs> kind of like your super float geek network that you have. So we were into turtles. Seriously. Totally. I mean, it was, it was amazing. So the question is, what are the walls that you've swum through? And what are the walls that you are going to swim through that aren't even there? They're stopping you. They're holding you back. 
but you can swim through them. And that's the work of this group, to help people, not just yourself, but all of your clients, all of your colleagues, break down those walls and swim through them across vast oceans lying on the other side. Now, our understanding of this conversation is getting a lot deeper, thanks to people like Justin and his colleagues. The research continues to move forward. We're understanding our brains in a completely new way. And the old way was kind of as a black box. You could stimulate the brain, and then you could see what happened. You can ask people how it felt and write that down and, and talk about that. But you couldn't really look inside. Early neuroscience required uh, a used brain of somebody who was done with it that you could look at and see what might have gone wrong with that brain while it was in use. But that was a very different endeavor. Right? So studying used brains was the way neuroscience was carried out. Now we can look at brains while they're in fact in use. Brains in progress. Brains shrinking and growing. Brain plasticity. Brain on flotation. Brains on water, brains on music. The technology continues to grow, continues to expand, and blow our minds, literally. We're now able to understand the brain at rest relative to the active brain, and we know physiologically, and our neuroanatomy is, in fact, different. We're able to understand our chemistry and understand dopamine and serotonin, understand chemicals like oxytocin, that are implicated in trust, in building trust. So you are boosting oxytocin. You are putting people into a state of trust and awareness and expansiveness and, and wall breaking. It's incredible, in fact, what this group of people does for our fellow humans. We're understanding how love works the levers that slide up and down and different mixes of neurochemistry. And I, I just want to caution you, if you're starting to geek out on the neuroscience, particularly the neuroscience of love, um, there's a time and a place to talk about it. My, my wife does not dig it. So when, when things are getting really nice and, and romantic and I talk about oxytocin and serotonin, really bad idea. So I just... You know, I know, you can get kind of enthusiastic about this stuff, and there's a time and a place for it. And maybe you already knew that, but I just thought I'd, I'd offer that free, unsolicited advice. The world is just exploding in terms of the applications of neuroscience. And you go to the library, and you go to the section on science, and you'll find book after book after book on the neuroscience of, of illusion and magic, the neuroscience of music, the neuroscience of stress and creativity, neuroplasticity, on and on and on. There's even a book on the neuroscience of bacon. <laughs> Just kidding, there isn't a book on bacon. <laughs> but that's a funny joke because I thought there would be a book on your, our brains on water, the neuroscience of water, and there wasn't. And so I tried to convince fellow scientists, neuroscientists to write that book, and I wasn't successful. So I had to buckle down and, and write it, and it took five years. Um, Nobel Prize winners in neuroscience who are studying our brain's ability to build mental maps. Doesn't sound relevant to this conference, but it totally is. The neurons that create the maps that allow you to find your way back into this room, even though you may not have been here before, back to your hotel room, or in particular, back to that coffee cart. Uh, really important neural maps <laughs> that we need to create. The cover of Scientific Ma uh, American Magazine the science of meditation on the cover. That's awesome. That would have been like the punchline of a joke 10 years ago. And now there it is, bam, on the cover. This generation is the first to have a decent user's guide to our brain. Think about that. Some people take things out of the package and they throw the user's guide away anyway. But this is the first generation that at least has that option to not throw the user's guide away to open it up and read it, and to think about how our brains work. And the question, the fundamental question is, what are we going to do with that? Why is it important, and how are we going to apply this incredible knowledge to our lives? Now, let's be reminded that we are a water planet, but it's a bit of an illusion. That big marble, well, that's all the water. 
That slightly smaller marble, that's the fresh water. And that really teeny, tiny, tiny, teeny one, that's the fresh water we have access to. So this illusion from space is, in fact, a bit of an illusion. When we get out on the water, it changes the way we feel. The cognitive, emotional, psychological, and social, and some people say spiritual. I say spiritual. I had just said spiritual. <laughs> In public, I'm a scientist, I said spiritual. Look at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Those benefits of water are real. They're measurable. That's new. That's exciting. I call this emerging field that connects our brains to our water planet neuroconservation. How are we going to use neuroscience to take care of our planet? Well, as we begin to understand that healthy water is medicine, it doesn't come in a pill. It comes out there. You just have to go get it. It occurs in your facilities. You just have to get in there. Our world is increasingly stressful, more and more. I don't need to go too, into deep about, too deep into that. You know it's true. And we all wish we could go to the doctor and, and have that happen. <laughs> just, can, you, can you just take it out, please? Just pop it open, pull it out. Let's get rid of that. At the extreme, we have post-traumatic stress. That's the extreme, extreme case. But we're all dealing with some level of chronic stress in one way or another, psychological stress. And that is the state I refer to as red mind. For a lot of people, it's the dominant state of mind that they live with. Those are the people who show up at your door saying, I need a little help. I need a break. I need some rest. People are living in fear of their neighbors other neighbors literally next door, of our neighbors to the north and the south and the east and the west, of our neighbors who look different. They're living in fear of ideas. We're stimulated to be afraid. In contrast to red mind is what I call blue mind. And that's what we deal in, blue mind. Delivering blue mind. Guiding people into their blue minds. Now, we've known about this forever a long, long, long history of art and literature describing the human emotional relationship with our waters. People used to stand on line to stand in front of paintings like this. They'd wait on line and pay money to stand in front of paintings by the great masters of water because it made them feel something big, bigger than themselves. Imagine that, standing in line to look at a painting of the ocean. The modern masters, this is my, my brother, John Imber, who passed away last year of ALS, painted into his last days as he lost the ability to use his right hand, he switched to his left, then he put the paintbrush in his mouth, and when he couldn't hold it in his mouth, he strapped it to his head and painted this of the main coast. He was in love, passionately in love with the ocean and my sister and their son. Rand Ortner paints the water. Massive triptychs, sometimes five inches of paint stuck to the canvas. His paintings look like photographs. Poets describing our deep connection to water as a source of creativity and imagination. Jim Harrison, writer I like to read. That sound, you know that sound. Now. Corona got it. They built a, a whole ad campaign that built a brand that sold a lot of really bad beer to unsuspecting <laughs> Americans, thinking that they were getting a, a bottle of vacation or something. Um, first giveaway, clear bottle, first giveaway. Second giveaway, the taste. But um, amazing ad campaign, all about water. Hollywood gets it. Shawshank Redemption, remember that film? The last line of the film. The last line, the film ends with that. We dream of water. We long for it. Little Leo up in the bow of the Titanic. What was he saying there? I'm king of the world. Surrounded by water. 
surrounded by it. Made him feel so good. Then he goes back with his lover, and they feel really good too. Now, we'll just pretend the story ends right there. <laughs> Otherwise, my thesis is not supported. You cool with that? Is that right? We'll let James Cameron know that we just sort of adjusted things. Remember that scene from, he from here to eternity. Imagine that scene without the water. <laughs> kind of weird, totally. <laughs> Rolling around in your underwear in the sand. Ew, like gross. What? Not sexy at all. Like not romantic, not memorable, no Academy Award, game over. But you add the water and it's good. Whoa. <laughs> This is scandalous, really, it was quite scandalous. Cities like Modesto, they knew that water was key when they built this archway into their city. Water is all about happiness, right? They knew that. This is not a new idea. Places like Pittsburgh are restoring their waterways, bringing them back, and bringing back the soul of their cities ancient idea that water is medicine. Say it again. Water is medicine. One more time. Water is medicine. It is. Oliver Sacks, one of the great neurologists who's in his dying days right now, swims every day and got his best ideas his best ideas, this is a brilliant man with numerous New York Times bestsellers. Smart, smart guy, his best ideas came to him while swimming. So he had to keep a notebook handy to jot them down. This is Naoki, 13-year-old boy who wrote a bestseller about autism. Here's what he had to say about water. I'm free and happy there, free and happy. I feel like you, because the world is so noisy. But in the water, I'm free. That's what it's about. This is Martin Pollock, veteran from the UK, returned from service, missing both legs and an arm. He planned on being a, a blob on a stool, he said, in the pubs with his buddies, with his mates. But then he got on a surfboard and saw his life ahead of him, got on the water. Now Martin is a surfer. He sees himself as a surfer, and he's an ambassador. Not only is he amb an ambassador for surfing, he is an ambassador for the ocean, for our waters. So if you want to dig more into the research, you can look up the work of the at the University of Exeter Medical School, look up Blue Space. Michael White and his colleagues have produced a, a vast um, body of literature. So it's a, another uh, list of references for you to, to dig into, along with the others that have been mentioned throughout these past few days. Well, we need access to that water, and that's what this is all about. Keeping the gates open, opening more flotation centers, giving people access to their waters. This is Jarmila. She lived for 10 years in a nursing home, suffering of Alzheimer's. My friend Greg met her and said, where do you want to go? And she said, I want to see the ocean. She got to the ocean. She stood up out of her wheelchair. And he said, I didn't know you could stand. I didn't know you could walk. As she shuffled forward, and she said, I didn't have anything to walk for until I saw the water. That's Jarmila. We limit access in lots of ways. Culturally, we limit access. We need to open the doors to everybody. And that may take some work. It may take some reaching out. It may take some education. It may take some, some active behavioral change. But people around the world need to get back in their water, like our friend Carlos in Mozambique, who was told his whole life that his people didn't dive. They didn't swim. They didn't go in the water. And he said, I want to dive. I want to be a diver. And I want to take other people diving. And he became the first dive master from Mozambique. And now he takes people diving, opening up their eyes to a whole new water world. Now, we can have access, but sometimes people go there and they bring their devices. 
which closes them down completely. So imagine getting in a float tank and then and tweeting the whole time or YouTubing the whole time. And I know you've done it, but you don't have to admit it. It's okay. Those waterproof iPhone cases are really handy, but people get, to, they get access. They have the privilege of access, and then they have their faces down in their devices. I'd rather replace that device with a baby turtle, right? Leave the smartphone home, here's a baby turtle, take that to the ocean <laughs> and release it. So home stretch here. Water gives us awe and wonderment. When we feel awe, scientists tell us, we change. It changes our brain's chemistry. It changes our body. We switch from a me perspective to a we perspective. And then what happens? Our compassion grows. Our trust deepens. Our creativity expands. When we have solitude, which is becoming more and more rare in, in our world, we can get in touch with ourselves. Justin pointed out this study earlier about the electrical shocks, and I won't go into that in detail, but we're losing the ability to do solitude. We're losing our privacy in lots of ways in this connected world. Water gives us romance. When we fall more deeply in love with ourselves, we can fall more deeply in love with others. Crash told a story about his experience, and he learned to love himself again, which allowed him to love others. Of course, we relax, we reduce our stress, and that's very, very important because stress is implicated in a whole range of modern diseases and illnesses. We find our most precious memories and nostalgia when we're near, in, on, and underwater. And this all comes back to one thing, love. Love for ourselves, love for each other, and love for this little planet that we share. So my challenge to you, my encouragement, is to continue to build those bridges that you're building between people and themselves and each other and further. Their favorite water, the local water, your lakes and rivers and creeks and oceans and bays and swimming holes and ponds, wherever you are, make that connection. When people can't surf, they should float. <laughs> when they can't kayak, they should float. When they can't scuba dive, they should float. Really, it'll reactivate the stoke. And I want you to take that blue marble, and here's your homework. You knew there would be homework. Take your blue marble, keep it safe, but pass it on. It may be today, it may be tomorrow, it may be in 10 years, but I want you to take your blue marble and put it into the hand of somebody that you need to say thank you to for what they're doing and ask them to do the same thing. And you'll see your blue marble float around the world and around and around. Thanks for what you're doing. Keep it up. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs>